are live. Hey, everybody, Mitch Jackson joining you with Madison. We are here on Human.Social. This is the show, everyone, where I love sharing people that are disrupting industry, meets and change around the world, or standing on the toughest mountain on the planet, and that would be Mark Cabot. Mark, it's good to see you today. How you doing, my friend? Uh, hey, you know what? I'm doing great. Actually, I'm doing better because uh, 12 days ago, I was standing on top of the world, and uh, you know, I dropped uh, 25 pounds. I'm only down 15 right now, so I'm making my way back into the game. Ooh, we we're all worried about you. I'm telling you, Mark, you shared your your journey, you know, to Everest and up to the top of Everest over on Instagram, some of the other social platforms. We're going to be sharing that with our audience today, both live and recorded. Mark's okay. going to share with us some of his, some interesting videos that he kind of teased me about before we went live. And this is gonna be a fun show. We're gonna be diving into, into Mark's mindset. Uh, what made him decide to conquer the seven tallest peaks or mountains around the world in each continent and how we can maybe take away some of the things that Mark teaches to help us move forward in 2021 and 2022 out of this crazy upside down COVID-19 world. Before we get started, super short intro, Mark, because it's important everyone knows who I'm talking about. Uh, Mark's a man who not only just climbed Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, but he's also someone who has climbed the six highest other mountains on each of the continents to complete what's called the Seven Summit challenge. Mark's the first NFL football player to do this. And we're going to talk a little bit about the NFL. Got to talk football, Mark. And sure. in addition to the above, Mark's an accomplished entrepreneur, philanthropist, podcaster, and executive. He's a man who's lived an incredible life and a man with many multiple missions. In addition to having Mark share his Mount Everest journey or adventure with us, we're going to dive into his why. We're going to talk a little bit about his success mindset, how he's gotten behind uh, helping us resolve epilepsy, dominate it, fix it, push it to the side, and why he's so passionate about that. And uh, your live Q&A, everyone that's coming in right now, whether you're watching this on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, over on the Facebook groups, our blogs, over on Amazon Live, ask your questions. They're coming into my ad panel as we speak. I'll ask Mark these questions on your behalf, and we're going to have a great time today on the show. Share this out on social media and enjoy today's show. Mark, why don't we get started? Um, what's it like standing on the tallest mountain in the world? Uh, you know, on one hand, it's incredible. On the other hand, um, and, you know, I don't know, again, if you if you saw this post or not, but um, I really struggled. Um you know, I, I trained for the last couple of years just, you know, relentlessly. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'd really tap into all those chits I put in the bank. Um, uh, super strong the entire time. I was up there about 70 days. That's a long time to be away and a long time to suffer. Um, I usually was number one or number two in terms of uh, going into the, the different camps, climbing over, you know, 60 foot ice walls and, and making my way up. And, you know, most of the days I was super strong and there was a few of the days that I just didn't have it. And one of those days that I didn't have it happened to be on summit day. And, you know, when you, when you lead up to summit day, there's some predicting in terms of weather, when you think that we that window is going to be um, available to have safe passage to make it up there. And, you know, we were dealing with a lot of obstacles um, in addition to um, having COVID that broke out, you know, camp wide. And Ever Space Camp, too, by the way, is about a mile spread out. So I always thought it would be like a little campsite. Yeah, it's quite enormous. Um, and uh, that said, you know, we, we did our best to to keep independent of the other expedition groups and Sherpas. Um, but, you know, when it got down to it, there's a lot of people who – who got infected. So that, that was one thing that we were dealing with. So, you know, we got kind of through that. Um, we made a prediction to go up um, and we thought that the 21st, 22nd, something like that, there might be a crease, there might be an opening. Um, something else that hit um, Nepal was a cyclone. And so in addition to waiting for the jet stream to go up and, and allow us for safe passage, because normally it's blowing 200 miles per hour up there, um, there's a cyclone that hit. So all that, that moisture that came in down below in, in Kathmandu, you know, that's rain. And when you get up top, that's high winds and a lot of snow. 
And so we started our way up the mountain, which means number one, going through the Kumba Icefall, which I did five times, petrifying, um, to say the least. There's 30 foot ice walls everywhere, um, constantly collapsing. There wasn't one time that I went through the same route, um, kept crashing down and, and moving and shifting and uh, literally moves three feet a day. And so these big ice walls are all like sideways and and leaning on each other. And when they move, they collapse. And so a lot of people got hurt in there. Um, and, you know, you just cross your fingers when you go through about four o'clock in the morning, coldest time of the day to go through. So everything's frozen that, you know, your number is not going to come up that day. And so uh, we went through that. And then we climbed up to Camp 2. We stayed there for a few days. Not great weather. From there, we moved up to Camp 3. Camp 3, you have to climb over a huge ice wall to get to kind of climb into it. And it sits on a 45-degree slope. And so what they do is they cut into it and they put your tents. And that was a whole nother dynamic. We got in a big storm up there blowing. You know, we were hoping we were going to get blown off the mountain, probably 40, 50-mile-per-hour winds. We were stuck in our tent for 36 hours straight. And then about the, I think it was the 22nd, we decided to head towards the top. And the top is now the South Coal, 26,500 feet. And um, meanwhile, through this Camp 3, Camp 4, you know, we're eating freeze dried food. So answering your question, I just didn't have a whole lot of energy. So, you know, I would love to sit here and tell you it was the most amazing experience of standing up there and throwing my arms up and jacked up and all the work I put in and completing the seven summits. But at the end of the day, you know, I had to tap into all these different things I'd learned a long time ago in football, that mindset, overcoming adversity. Um, I climbed out of my tent at uh, about 11.45 um, um, on the 22nd, technically, I guess it was. So 50 minutes later, it was the 23rd. And um, there was probably 45 mile per hour winds and they were going sideways and they were blowing these little ice pellets and, and I became snow blind in my left eye. It also just ravaged my whole side of my face. So it looked like a sunburn, you know, it was all scabbed up. I was wearing a, a, uh, a oxygen mask. And as I was going up the mountain, which is coming out of camp, it's extremely steep, um, actually all the way to the very top. You know, I just ran into a lot of problems and, I struggled. I was out there. I, I was and, out and Mark, there. Mark, Mark, yeah. can I interrupt you real quick? Because there's a bunch yeah, of questions of coming in. So I don't think everyone appreciates how long it took you once you arrived, let's just say at the site on the venue, yeah. maybe yeah. that first village, to when you eventually summited. I can just tell by some of the questions. This took you how long from start to finish? Well, I was up there, you know, 70 days, right? 70 so, days. I mean, Thank yeah. You. So Thank so you. there there's a there's a heck of a long time that you know, and then let me explain that for a second because that's really important. And the reason why we're up there for, you know, two months plus is just because that you have to build up red blood cells. You can't just go to 17,500 feet and feel great. And so we started at 7,500 feet. We climbed 40 miles all through all these different villages. We finally made it in our way to Everest Base Camp. Once we got there, then we'd go up to camp one, we'd come back down. We'd go up to camp two and we'd come back down. And so this went on and on and on pretty much through the whole uh, month of, of um, May. And finally, towards the end, when the jet stream rises and we've built in the red blood cells so you don't go up there and you get sick and nauseous and everything else, um, we go for our attempt. And that's what we did on the 23rd of May. Mm, let me... Let me bring myself back into this. I could just sit here and listen to you all day. So bear with me, Mark. Got a lot going on in this end. You yeah, no, no. I can, I can see some people out there. Hey, Mitch from Ross and Alicia and Jennifer. Uh, it's a, what, what, you, what, this is awesome. I love this. This is a really cool platform. You're seeing actually the tip of, of the iceberg when it comes to this platform. And let yeah. me go ahead and just get rid of some of these banners in just a second. But uh, Mark, listen, you said something about you know, being uh, ice blind in one eye, yeah. and some of the some of us that have that have done some backpacking, some low level climbing in, the, in over the years, that could be dangerous. I mean, I think a lot of climbers on Everest, you tell me, they make these life life or death decisions on whether to summit or not. What what allowed you to tell yourself I can move forward despite being blind in one eye? Well, the, the blindness part really came in, in um, you know, it really became a detriment, especially when I got up on the Hillary step. And I'm going to answer your question, but, you know, I just want to have everybody understand that 
on all these other mountains that you climb, you're always tethered to other people. So if you and I were to go climb Cotopaxi or Mount Rainier or something, you and I would be tethered together. Usually there's four people, you know, in a, in a rope team. And in this case, you're tethered to the mountain, you know, they're called fixed lines. And so when you're blind in one eye, which I was, you know, trying to reach down and clip in, especially around the Hillary step where you're looking straight down at Tibet, right? And you're walking past dead bodies. I mean, it's very eerie, scary. It's all those things. And trying to have the, have the depth perception to reach down and clip. I mean, it's not just the one line that, that, that exists on there that you have to clip into, but there's like four or five different lines that have been sitting there since, you know, 2010. And they're frayed and everything else. So you want to make sure that you're clipping in um, to the right rope as you're actually, you know, right. going up this mountain. And, and so going back to, to your question about, you know, how did you keep going? I had to tap into everything I had. I'd go 10 feet and I'd say things. My daughter was epilepsy. And so we'll get into that a little bit later, but I'd like, you know, Amelia, who's 22, her epilepsy started when she was eight. Like she wouldn't quit. I'm not quitting. Today is not the day that Mark dies. Today is the day that I keep going. I go 10 feet. I'd rest for about five minutes. I'd go up again. It took me 18 hours to go round trip. Imagine exercising for 18 flipping hours, going straight up a mountain at 29,000 feet and going through yeah. navigating through dead bodies and everything else. And, and you know, it, it, if it hadn't been, the weather started off awful, 4.30 in the morning, everything calmed down and then there was a beautiful sunrise. If it hadn't been epic like that, you know, I don't know what would have happened. And I kept yeah. saying, and even, so, so going back to your original question about what was that like, I got up there and I just sat down. I was gassed and I was, you know, I took a couple of pictures and everything, but I was like, oh God, now I got to go all the way back, right? And I started at 1230 um, uh, on the 23rd. I didn't get back till five o'clock that day. And then when I was coming down, I ran out of oxygen, right? So I was on the balcony. So I was about 27,500 feet. I was with a Sherpa, but he was about 200 yards below me. And he just kept wanting to get back to camp. And I just had no energy. And then I ran out of oxygen and I could see him down below, but I didn't know for sure, but I was having a hard time breathing. And so there's a, a regulator with a meter on it. And there's a Russian that came by me and I go, hey, what's it say on there? He goes, Nooski, Nooski. And so that was zero. And so I go, can you please go down and tell this guy to stop so I can get to him to get a new tank, you know? So I had all kinds of problems, but you know, at the end of the day, you either are standing on top or you're not. And you did. And we are all so proud of everything you've done, including, you know, summiting the other six top mountains in each continent. Whenever I get tired, whenever I get worn out, when I get a little, when I lack my motivation, there's somebody I reach out to. Mark, <laughs> and uh, I reached out to John to have him come in and join us and say hi. John, John. Ferrara, founder hey, of Nimble. Mark, I think you know this character, right? I do know John, and uh, he, I think he might have added a mustache since I've seen him last. So, <laughs> he yeah. did. He did. <laughs> this, this started out as a Movember mash to uh, cheer <laughs> on the Dodgers, and uh, you know, I, I'm still cheering them on. But, Mark, I was cheering you on. You Buddy, you inspire so many people. Okay. I think that your journey is such a testimony to any person that wants to achieve anything in this world, especially entrepreneurs who uh, are out there on the mountain by themselves so many times. And, and there's so many times they just want to give up. And if they only knew one more step, they're going to be right around that bend and the rainbow is going to open up like this rainbow I saw in the Nepali coast when I was trying to get my family to trudge through the mud to just get to that peak. And, and Mark, you know, you set some amazing goals. You are not a spring chicken. You kicked ass and you did it. And I just want to, I don't want to take up any more of the time other than say, love you, man. Thank appreciate you. you. And also appreciate the dedication you have to that beautiful family of yours. I just, uh, I've, I'm fortunate enough to know you personally and, and what kind of man you are and the family person that you are and the challenges you face, even with your own family, like we all do. And, uh, and I just, I love you and I just, I support you and I appreciate you. Well, that means a lot to me. And, and I got to tell you this, John, you know, I haven't seen you in a while, but John's my old neighbor and from Santa Monica. And, you know, I, uh, I, I, it wasn't just my daughter, Mitch. Um, 
you know, I'd been reading, you know, I hadn't seen any of these posts in six days or so as we were making our way up the mountain, but you know, there were numerous people. I mean, I blew my mind really is that whatever I was saying or posting um, resonated with a lot of people that were out there. And I got a lot of people that, you know, of course there were the keep going and we're rooting you on type thing, which is fun. But I got a lot of people who like, my name is so-and-so and I live in South Carolina and I'm going through a hard time or I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And you're really inspiring me to, you know, to pick it up and go and do something. And, you know, at the end of the day, I wasn't doing really this for anybody other than myself, because as John will tell you, you know, he's, he's uh, built some amazing companies and, you know, you got to have that love. You got to have that passion. You got to have that drive in order for you to get over the top because things aren't always easy. And when things get hard, you know, I keep going and others drop back. And that's, I think, the whole thing of that somehow or another, you got to get that mindset, but that love of whatever you do to keep going. Amen. Amen. I'm going to drop because I. this is all about you, Mark. I want people to hear Thank your you. journey. And uh, and I, if you're ever back in the neighborhood, let's go on a walk and uh, let's catch up. You guys come Love down. Love to so do that. Down. Thank you. Come down, John. Come down and we'll fly some drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and hit strands, okay? Let's do it. All right. John, thanks for coming on, buddy. Appreciate it. You Thank, Thank you, John. You. I really appreciate that, John. It means yeah. a lot. Thank you. You know, you know, what's interesting is because of John uh, sharing your journey on Instagram, Mark, you know, our our communities, people that that didn't know you were following each and every step up the mountain. Mm. And so thank you, John, for doing that. He's just been a, been a wonderful friend over the years. When he came down into my neighborhood, I picked him up one morning and we went down to one of my favorite beaches, played around with the drones, had a nice breakfast together. Uh -huh. You know, and, and th that's what life's all about. And, and talking about what life's all about. Two questions. Number one, I do want to, you know, let me just share with everybody just off the top of my head. You know, I know you were an All-American high school football player. You played at the University of Washington under legendary coach Don James. You played in the Aloha Bowl, Bowl a couple of times. I know you Rose caught Bowl. the Rose Bowl, but you caught the winning TD pass in the uh, which, orange, orange, orange Bowl. In, in the Orange Bowl, mm -hmm. which, you know, that's that's a cool story right there. Yeah. And having that mentality and then taking that over into business and, and taking it into what you're doing right now, right? You're encouraging mm -hmm. other people. You're helping other people. You're living mm -hmm. a, an interesting life. Um, my question to you, number one, is what got you interested in high high altitude climbing, number one? And maybe talk a little bit about what the seven summits are because I know a lot of people don't know what that is. And then number mm -hmm. two, what did you learn on the gridiron that allowed you to find success climbing mountains and conquering challenges in business? I was thinking a lot about that, you know, especially when I was coming down the mountain. Uh, so let's start with the first question about the seven summits. So the seven summits are the seven highest mountains on each continent. So, um, uh, we'll just, and actually, um, I don't know if you know this, but I've actually done nine. Um, I've done oh, Kilimanjaro. Yeah. yeah. I've done Kilimanjaro twice and I've done Denali. I've been on Denali twice. And so, um, what was you know, the most I, difficult well, Mount Everest for sure, Everest. but you know, yeah, but Denali is—I mean, it's its own animal too. I mean, we the, the the first the first year when we got up there, and again, talk about adversity, and you know, we got into some awful stormy weather. You know, and Denali again is up in Alaska, and it was minus eighty at the top, and it's just like for sure, if we went up uh, to the top, we got stuck at fourteen thousand five hundred feet. And if we continue to go all the way to the top, um, you know, we would start losing toes and fingers and everything else. And so obviously that's not what we want to do. The challenge with that too, is there's no Sherpa. It's the U S there are no porters. And so you have to carry your own stuff. So you're carrying 140 pounds on your back. Um, half of it's on a sled, half of it's, you know, in a pack and it's extremely challenging and you're going up the steepest, you know, hills, mountains that you can think of, and there's crevasses everywhere and there's avalanches coming down all the time. And, you know, it's, it's a, it, it's a, it's a big boy mountain, even though it's not as high as Mount uh, Everest, it's just under 22,000 feet, I believe. And um, it's hard, but, 
Um, you know, there's in, in that, the, I'll just go through these really quick in, in the highest mountain, highest mountain in, um, in Africa is, is Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. So I've been down there a couple of times. The second time was a blast. Cause I went down with a bunch of NFL guys, Chris Long, Harry Long's, uh, son. And we raised a bunch of money to build water wells, uh, for the people of the Maasai tribe. And so that really, hey, Mark, kind of Mark, Mark, Chris, Chris Long's, uh, junior college football coach was my, one of my son's football coaches in high school. Oh, is that right? He's a, he's a wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. You know, I've gotten to know Chris well, and I played with Howie. So that was an incredible moment. Um, and uh, so that was the first mountain. The second mountain, I, I flew off to uh, Europe. Um, the highest mountain there was in Russia. So, you know, who goes to Russia? I've been there now. And so down to the Caucasus Mountains, and that was plane, trains, automobiles, people with machine guns and you know, that was crazy. And then the third mountain, I flew to, to uh, Australia, um, climbed a mountain down there. It's kind of the fun seven. It's not that high, but it's a, a fun place to be in the snowy mountains, Mount Kosciuszko. And then the year after that, I flew to uh, Argentina, and there's a mountain there um, in the Andes um, called Aconcagua. I think you have to climb the mountain to be able to actually say that word. Aconcagua, that's almost 23,000 feet. And again, I none of these mountains I, I ran into any kind of altitude issues, which was great. Um, uh, and then after that, I did uh, Denali. And then that was in 2017. And then I had to go back and redo Denali again because I didn't hit it, you know, in 2017. So 2018, um, tagged it on June 6th. And then... Um, uh, and then I went down to Antarctica, which is such an amazing experience. You know, it's just, you know, obviously it's covered full of ice. You have to, again, fly down into Chile, the tip of Chile, um, Punta Arenas. And then you take a charter plane with a bunch of crazy Russians over in the land and the charter uh, on the ice. And then you take another small plane and, and you land at uh, Vincent, um, the Sea base camp. And then you go climb that. So it's a shorter, colder version of, of Denali. And then, of course, I was trying – I thought I was going to uh, Mount Everest last year in uh, 2020, and in the world, the whole planet shut down. And so we had to reset that. And so that's all been leading up to what I just, you know, accomplished, you know, 12 days ago. What – you know, growing up playing football, where did you play football? What state was it? Was it Seattle? Was it yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I went so, to one of the biggest high schools in Seattle, and and then the University of Washington is also right there in, in right, the city of right. Seattle. And so, so did that, you grow up climbing and hiking? Um, you know, yeah, it, it was – my dad did all that stuff, and it was really just the kind of the local mountains. For people who don't know, um, the, uh, the, the geography up there, it's kind of surrounded by – um, a lot of water and a lot of mountains. And so there's mm. plenty of, of access to get, you know, into the mountains quickly. And it was more just like the overnights or we're going to go on a three mile hike, you know, type of thing. So it wasn't the extreme. And that really didn't for me happen until 1998. And, you know, when I was living up there, I could see Mount Rainier on my window. And I was just like, you know, it, that, I've got to go climb this thing. And, and I'd always respected those, mountaineers you know talk about mentorship and what mentors can do for you in terms of giving you the guiding light and i've grown up with the whitaker brothers and ed Veesters oh, really? and some other guys yeah okay. just admiring those guys from far they're all my friends now so which is really cool but um you know i just always admired and i just thought that anybody that had ever climbed everest to, for me personally the way i saw them there was like a new added respect in terms of who they were because i knew that what they had to go through, you know, being months and months away from family and friends and conveniences and everything else and the comforts of everyday life to go and sacrifice and go through whatever they had to go through to climb that mountain. You know, you talk about sacrifice. I've got a couple of questions similar to what Alicia Kinchlow, who's a lawyer out of Philadelphia. Hey, Alicia, good friend of mine. Asked. Oh, sure. And, you know, Alicia's asking, you know, how long did you prepare? How long did you have to train uh, to climb Everest? But I think, you know, when it comes to preparing the other high mountains that you conquered, when it comes to preparing uh, for an upcoming game, when it comes to preparing for an important negotiation in the boardroom, can you maybe talk a little bit about whether one has anything in similar with the other? Are they completely different animals? Obviously, one's a little bit more physical than the others. But to talk to us, talk to us a little bit about preparing for Everest and then, you know, your takeaways for helping us prepare for similar challenges in life. It's a great question. Don't don't um, 
don't move this graphic away because I want to come back to it. And I want to oh, answer your it. question and then come back to Elisa's um, question because it's really important. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. So just to just to give a like a, a, a quick little synopsis, you know, I, I've been very fortunate to have some amazing experiences, two Rose Bowls, two Alaho Bowls, um, Orange Bowl, played in the NFL, played in a couple – um, different bowl games. I've had some success in businesses. I started a venture back gaming company, sold it, and now I'm an executive for Sports Illustrated. We started that. We started the parent company called Maven Technology Company five years ago, and, um, and now we've become quite quite large. I've helped take Sports Illustrated from the number 15 spot in terms of visitations to the number six spot. You know, in terms of people coming and hitting. Um, and we're, we're about to go public, which, um, you know, uplisted the NASDAQ. So, you know, really proud about those different things. And as I was, I was going back and I'm thinking, you know, what do, what does the seven summits, mountain climbing, Mount Everest, what, what's the business acumen of, of success and, and what does my, my college football, you know, what, what do those things have in common? And you talked about, you know, me being a, a All-American in high school, which I was. But, you know, back in those days, it was a different time and there was no club sports. And it wasn't, you know, an idea where people, the kids were in lifting when they were in the seventh grade and things like that. <laughs> and, and so all I did is kind of show up and I was better. I was a gym rat, but, you know, I didn't really work at my craft, right? I was just a gym rat that would go out there and love to play, but I didn't understand training and what it took to become a great champion. And when I got to the University of Washington, it was like a big bucket of cold water being thrown on me. And I can remember being out there my first day in August uh, for camp. And, and you know, I'm, I'm 181 pounds. I'm 6'3". And I can't bench my own weight. And I looked out there and there's all these guys that were really gunned up. They were confident, you know, they were strong. And I was just like, I'm just not that guy. And it took me, you know, a good six months to like figure it out and figuring out was you either get with the program or you don't. And Don James, so this gets into the, you know, the original question that you ask at the onset sure. of the show. <clears throat> which had to do with really the pyramid of success. And John Wooden, um, who we all know, especially in Southern California, you know, is a great basketball coach for UCLA, took that team to, um, to uh, 10 straight NCAA championships, not, not just the tournament, but they actually won the whole thing. And, and so our coach, Don James, had really adopted that. And it's, it's essentially when you're, you're looking at the pyramid – there's 25 individual and team blocks. And at the very top, there's kind of competitive greatness. And so you can replace those blocks with anything, you know, running, lifting, studying film, doing well in the classroom, you know, all the way up. And I had to go check all those boxes. And so it took me three years before I ever saw the field. And there were a lot of dark days in there too. And, and just because I did A didn't equate to B, right? But I knew that if I did all the things necessary, it would put me in the best position to to actually succeed if I ever got called on to be in that position when my number called and then it's just that as as the way things you know turned out we were playing Michigan um, my first game I started in Husky Stadium and my junior year and um, we were down by 14 points we came back in the fourth quarter we scored a touchdown there's two minutes to go we got the ball back we drove the length of the field. And with like eight seconds to go, they threw me a ball in the back of the end zone. I reached up, I grabbed it, and I came down. And everybody was celebrating me and carrying me. You know, we won the game. I was in Sports Illustrated. And and what people didn't understand is that I had done that play a thousand times. I'd visualized success in that play. I'd run that play in practice. I'd done that in my sleep. I did it in my backyard. You know, so even though they, they saw me in that moment, I'd done it a thousand times, right? And so it really set the tone that when you're sitting in a room, super competitive, I'm sitting now in a room with the Raiders and Tom Flores has given us a speech about of the 155 guys that are here right now for training camp, you know, hundred are going to get cut. When I'm on the mountains and people are going, why are you doing this? You're going to die. You know, it's so selfish because you shouldn't be doing this for your family. And I'm asking like, why not me? Why can't I be that guy, right? So you have all these people here in your chat room, and we were all faced with that question. You're like, why not me? Why not you? Why why can't you be that person that sets the record? Why can't you be the person that you know does something extraordinary? I'm ordinary, but I've just worked my ass off, 
And then the close cousin to why not me is, is, is commitment, is that competitive greatness, is that you got to love the process. I love playing football. I love building businesses and I love scaling mountains. And so going back to, to Alicia's question right here, how and for how long do you prepare? I've been doing this since I was like 13, right? Um, in terms of constantly keeping myself in shape. I'm 59 years old and I still have a lot of what my foot, my, my football shape used to be. And, you know, this, I'm, I, I live in Sun Valley, Idaho. I'm looking at the up outside my window right now at the mountain. And during the winter, there's something called skinning, which is putting this sandpaper type material on the bottom of your skis. And you can actually go up the mountain. So you're not sliding back on skis. And then you get to the top and you rip them off. And I did that 45 times this, this, this winter. And it's not easy going up 3000 feet, right. To the top and cold, um, either at night when it's dark with a headlamp on or early in the morning when it's freezing. And, but I knew that that was part of the preparation that I had to make in order to answer that question. Why not me? Well, if it's going to be one on new, you got to associate the work that goes into it. Um, people who win are sometimes lucky. You don't, you don't normally equate people who lose as lucky, right? Because they haven't put in the work, right? So that's that's my kind of long-winded answer to why not me and how long did it take you to prepare? It, you know, I've been at this now for many years. And I just really haven't let up. Well, I think I think uh, Alicia says it's best. Wow. You know, and that 10,000 hours to perfect something, to become good at something, doesn't necessarily start last week when you have a new idea. Maybe it did start back in the early foundation of your mm -hmm. life, of your training, of your philosophy, of your mindset, right? People need to put in the time. They don't need to be so hard on themselves uh, along the journey. And, and speaking of the journey, a buddy of mine, I don't know if you know Bernard Nomberg. He is a uh, work comp lawyer out of Alabama, also one cool. of Vanderbilt's top all-time quarterbacks. I'm going to say that, Bernard, since you cannot – uh, fight me on that issue. But Bernard asked the question, you know, for those of you listening to the podcast version, which are more impactful, the journey while training for the climbs or reaching the summits? You know, actually, I'm going down, Bernard. I'm going down this uh, this weekend. I'm playing in a, in a uh, golf charity golf a guy named Steve Azar. He's a country music star and he's got a, a, um, a golf tournament I'm participating in in Greenville, Mississippi. So I'm going to be down in your <laughs> neck of the woods. It should be fun. I love the journey. You know, part of the journey, like like I, I we spent a little bit of time talking about the summit, and I had a, a difficult day on that summit. But you know, the gosh, the the going to Nepal. Um, when I got to Kathmandu, I was asked to come and visit an uh, orphanage and all these kids. And that was such a blessing, you know, to go visit with them. The Lama runs it, a Lama runs it. Um, you know, the, 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 the trek going from Lukla, the world's most dangerous airport that lands on the side of a cliff and the r runway goes up to landing on that, experiencing that, um, having the 40 mile trek in and seeing that the way all these people live at 15, 16, 17,000 feet. I was at a, it was a little cafe shop, um, coffee shop, you know, they can build themselves the world's highest, you know, coffee shop at 17,000 feet. And it was insane to be in there and be drinking, you know, and talking and communicating with the, the locals. Um, I gotta tell you the Sherpa people are the most amazing people. Um, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. And they are so high on the happiness factor. And I found the same thing when I was in the Serengeti um, in Tanzania. And I'd be out there. And, you know, the currency for the people of the Maasai tribe, and there's a bunch of villages, um, is a goat. So that's what they're trading. And to see them as happy as they are, it was just a blessing. And then, you know, we built this water well for them. And so they didn't have to walk five miles away with a bucket on their head and fill full of water. And most of the time it was these, these young girls and they were getting attacked or raped or something else. It was awful. So for us to be able to have that water, a spigot where they could just turn it on and the joy and um, the happiness and the gratefulness was just off the chart. And it just really made me think about like, you know, when I have a bad day or I've got so much compared to what they have, you know, it's, it's just amazing to see what they're, how they process life. 
So the, the experiences, the memories, the interactions, those those have a bigger impact on you, on who you are, what you do, how you feel, than actually standing on top of the summit. Yeah, I mean, I'd be lying to you because I'm a goal oriented guy. If I didn't, if I didn't say, you know, the end goal, like you can see right here. Right. There we go. I mean, you know, there's my Raider jersey, and behind there is a Hall of Fame jacket from the University of Washington. And nice. you know, I, I would be, I'd be lying to you if I said you know, that, that reaching my goal, um, isn't important. And I can't imagine what I'd be going through right now if I hadn't reached the summit, because most of the people up there didn't reach the summit. They got caught in, in, in the weather or COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's more like the explanation point of saying I made the summit, but boy was, you know, N Nepal, what a journey. And let me show you all the pictures that had nothing to do with the summit. I have like four pictures of the summit, and I've, you know, 1,200 of the journey. You know, that's where it was at. You know, why don't we, do you mind if I just try to bring in your Instagram feed? And we sure. Can slide through and show some of these pictures. Or do you want to try to uh, show the video that we tried to bring up earlier? Well, one of the things that we didn't talk about, and I didn't really talk about a whole lot even when I was there, is how terrifying, you know, this can be. And I'll, I'll bring up this video right now. Let me just set this up for everybody. Um, that the video you're going to see was an avalanche that came at us. And every day we had avalanches every single day. And the first probably 10 days, like when we, we were at Everest Base Camp and, you know, avalanches were coming down, you, you jump out of your tent and you run out there and you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And then, you know, it, it would divert off. I was going through the, the Kumba Ice Fall. I was by myself. It was probably 5 o'clock in the morning. There's nobody around me, and I look up and I see this gigantic avalanche coming right at me. I was just like, "It's over," and kind of at the last minute veered off. But the one I'm going to show you right now was, um, yeah, I, I was taken. Uh, let me go back here and share yeah, and it, my screen. And Mark, it may not display in your video, but I'll give you a thumbs up if it's displaying properly for our audience. So don't worry. Sure. About okay. And then we got sure. a ton of questions, you guys. This is so cool. Thanks for the questions coming from all over the internet. Let me bring this up, add to stream, and let's see. We're seeing. Can you, can you see this? So what we're seeing are multiple screens instead of just the video. Uh, try to go to hit the video. Okay. And let's see if this you works. Can and it, can you enlarge that video so it takes up the whole screen? Because I'm looking at a lot of other videos. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So what you can see here is an avalanche coming right at my tent. I'm my, oh my God. My, my tent is this orange thing right in front of you. Um, right. And we had popped out. And this is a mountain that um, is coming right through the Kumba Icefall. And the mountain is called uh, Nupsi, N U P T S E. Yeah, I made us both right. That was my tent mate and my, uh, my climbing partner. And this thing is coming right at us, man. And at what point did you tell yourself, I'm going to stand here and keep filming, or maybe we need to zig uh, left or right to get out of the way? Well, the whole time. And, the, and the, yeah. And, and, and one of the problems, one of the problems with, with, yeah, this is almost done. You know, I'll, I'll get out of it and I'll stop sharing and then I should be back with you. One, one, of the, one of the problems with, with the way these things go, and it happened three days after we, we came down from camp two, and that was um, that when these avalanches come down like that, um, there is all this turbulence. And, the, and even though that the actual snow may not hit your tent, the turbulence, and which picks up a lot of rocks and now is going 100 miles per hour, comes and wipes out things. And this is what happened, I think it was in 2016 up there. And it happened at camp two, uh, two days after we left, um, a side of uh, the other side of uh uh, Dempsey came down and um, that turbulence um, fast forwarded through and literally blew apart all of camp too. So all the tents that we had up, they all got wiped out, every single one of them. And there's some people that were actually in them that just laid flat and then went right over the top. But all the tents got ripped and just torn apart. 
So Peter Gorell out of uh, Vancouver, I believe, I know he's in Canada, asked the question that I was thinking, you know, can we expect a book? Can we expect a movie? It sounds like you've had an amazing life with a lot of experiences and uh, could probably add value to the rest of us. What are your thoughts well, on that, Mark? Well, thank you so much, Peter. I appreciate that. And you're actually my, my Seattle neighbor, which is up the street in Vancouver, BC, if that's where you're from, or even to the south, down, down by uh, uh, Portland. Um but no, I, you know, I, 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 I was super blessed because when I, um, um, you know, in the number of months kind of leading up to it, and I've got a very busy, you know, life between podcasting and working out and working at SI and things like that. And, you know, I was kind of poking and kicking tires really on, you know, could, could there be figure out a way to like actually film this thing and, and um, um, with about a month ago or so, the NFL called me. And they got involved in, in a lot of this. And so the NFL is um, creating a, a documentary on this whole Everest um, experience. They flew over to Sun Valley, Idaho. Um, they interviewed, um, obviously, myself. They filmed myself a lot. Um, and uh, they also interviewed Jim Mora, who was a longtime uh, NFL coach and uh, coach for UCLA. And he's over here and he trained with me quite a bit. So they had a big interview with him. Ed Vister's is in the movie. My daughter's in the movie. And so this doc is coming out this September. I'm, 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 I'm over the moon grateful that, number one, they would have picked me. Number two, um, that this is going to be – right now they're on summer hiatus, like all of the, the TV shows that are out there. And so when they come back, like everybody else, in, in early September, this is their premiere episode. Great question. Peter, thank you very much. Always good to see you, my friend. Talk to us a little bit about Higher Ground, uh, Mark. What's that all about? Uh, how can we get more involved in helping with taking on epilepsy? Thank you, Mitch. So my daughter, uh, John Fiora, knows her. Um, uh, uh, her name is Amelia. And Amelia has had epilepsy since, since she was eight years old. She's now 22. She goes to the... Um, uh, University of Arizona, and she's had a lot of struggles, man. She, you know, ha haven't been able to, you know, ride a bike. She can't drive a car. Um, school at times has been challenging for her in terms of comprehension. Um, she has the type of epilepsy where she has daily seizures. And so they usually ask like last like five to eight, 10 seconds. And so, um, you know, when this was all ramping up and again, my experience go, going back to water boys in terms of giving back, um, I decided to to um, partner up with an organization happens to be here, um, and we we called Higher Ground. Higher Ground serves a lot of military um, people in, in in particular, but it's all about the cognitive and adaptive um, issues that they go through. And so, um, just really loved who they are and what they stand for. And and so, there's my daughter right there. And so um, we created this, this campaign called Amelia's Everest. Um, and um, the whole goal was to try to raise the height of Mount Everest, and, and, which is 29,035 feet. And so blessed that not only did the NFL um, throw money in towards this, uh, you can see the NFL Foundation there on the left, but also the Las Vegas Raiders, extremely supportive of what I was doing and wanted to be involved in Amelia's Everest. And so there's Jim Moore and I actually uh, talking about the, um, um, I think we're raising some additional money uh, on a campaign, but we, we ended up raising over $56,000 and combined with water boys. Now we've raised over 150 grand. So I'm very proud that, you know, I was able to pay it forward and um, not just, you know, make this a personal journey. 100% of all the funds I've ever raised have all gone towards these foundations. Not one penny has gone to me or my hikes or my adventures. Uh, that's all come out of my own pocket. And, and um, you know, it's, I think that's what we all should be doing is you, you hit a certain success level in life and you, you got to pay it forward. You know, you mentioned the University of Arizona. That's where I went to school, Mark. I was born and raised outside of town on a small ranch. I squeezed a four-year degree into a five-year experience on campus. <laughs> I, I would not, I would not change a thing in the world. And um, my daughter went to UCLA. She went to USC for law school. My son's a senior now uh, at USC, and I understand you have another daughter that's involved with sports activities at USC. 
Yeah, well, she's now the uh, sports. Yeah, she went to USC. Now she's a sports reporter for Sports Illustrated, covering USC. But you know, she's actually she's also in the movie, and and you know, so um, you know, we're talking a lot about Amelia's Everest right now, and my daughter Amelia, and she's trying to overcome that. And I really believe that she's going to. And I think a lot of what we've been doing, like what I've been doing, and seeing her dad out there, and like I named the campaign, and you got the NFL that's really supporting her. It's really given her those wings to fly high and to really give her that empowerment. And I believe that she's going to be healed, you know, soon. And um, really, really excited about that. Um, when you start talking about Claudette, my older daughter, who went to USC, you know, the reason why the NFL wanted to talk to her was because the question is, you know, what's it like being the daughter? You know, Amelia had a couple of grand malls that fell down in the kitchen and fell into her arms. And we thought she was going to die. Amelia was going to die. And so for Claudette to have to react to that, you know, as her sister, um, you know, it's tough stuff. And so they wanted to get her reaction on, you know, how she's been supportive towards Amelia. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. You know, it's uh, it's tough as a dad, right? Uh, family members that suffer and there's there's nothing we can do and we want to help. And for those individuals here that would like to help, uh, Mark, with what you're doing, um, stay in touch with you. I know you've got a podcast. Let me bring up for everyone watching the live video. If you're listening to the podcast, it's <clears throat> higher ground, quote unquote, quote. You can go to Mark Patterson. P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. Mark, that's a good place for people to maybe start to connect with you and the things we're talking about, right? I love connecting with everybody, man. And, and okay. you know, fire away with questions. But, you know, um, that's where, you know, anybody can find my Finding Your Summit. Um, I've got, I've done now exactly 200 episodes and of like 125,000 downloads. And so it's, it's become fully popular. There's a lot of, fairly famous people that are on there that that is exciting. I've, I've this is the first time in three years I've taken a, a quick time out, um, yeah. you know, to, uh, yeah. Thank you, Ross on that too, on the philanthropy. Yeah. So if you want to, you know, contribute, participate in any of that, again, hundred percent goes to higher ground um, that you can, you can follow that whole thread on that and then all my social media and stuff like that. But, you know, one of the things you talked about, Mitch, was, you know, showing, you know, for anybody who hasn't seen my Instagram, everything is Mark Patterson NFL. So you can just go to wherever and um, any, any social that's out there and you can tag into that. But um, if you pull up the Instagram, Mitch, um, anything try. that's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's there's a, there's a, a So, so go, for example, right there and, and hit that ladder. So I posted that this morning. It's the first one on the left. So, so what happens, this is going through the Kumbaya show. So this gives you a little taste of what I, and so if you can imagine going through this at four or five o'clock in the morning, and in this case, I was by myself. And typically what you want is that rope that you see that's a fixed line and you want to have somebody on one side or the other, you know, holding that. So it just provides more stability because on the bottom of your, your boots, you're wearing crampons. So those are like two, three inch spikes, you know, from, from toe to heel that you have to walk across that ladder and, and down in that crack, which is called a crevasse. Um, it lies about 130 feet and it is solid. You know, it's like hitting cement if you fall off that thing. And so when I went across that, I, I can tell you that I didn't spend a whole lot of time, you know, like taking my time moving across that ladder. It's about a 12 foot ladder. And it was fairly terrifying in that I was doing it by myself. And it just, it's just the way that the group all kind of fanned out um, that, uh, that it played out that way. But, um, you know, those, those uh, ice blocks are constantly moving. This one, uh, go back up. Um, I just want to give a quick, Quick shout out. I'll give you another ladder shot. Actually, you go to that one right next to the to the left side of the uh, the flowers. Gotcha. Who, uh, Mark? Who lays down the ladder and the ropes? There's got to be a lot of trust on that mountain if you don't know who did it. Yeah. So that's me going uh, uh, across another ladder onto a higher lope because I uh, to a higher um, uh, elevation you know, to, so I can get across that crevasse. Um, so there's something called the ice doctors. And so it's a group of Sherpa 
that are hired by the Nepalese government to go up there and lay down the track because otherwise you'd never get through it. I have no idea how Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzin Norway, um, the first guys that summoned it in 1953, right. actually, you know, made it across because there were no ice doctors, right? So how they did that was really incredible. And then I want to show you another thing. So this this is really inspiration to me. Go to the left of that um, um, of that photo, and you can see us both in there. So this guy's name is Art Muir. And Art became the oldest um, gentleman to ever climb um, Mount Everest at 75 years old. So, you know, I'm 59. I thought, you know, I was old, but, um, you know, this guy took it to a different level and he got up there. I think he was the first guy of our group that summited that morning. He got, he took off two or three hours before we did, but um, wonderful person, full of zest, full of life. And, you know, it's just a great example of just because he turned a certain age, he retired from being a lawyer, um, uh, didn't, for him, didn't mean that he was going to shut his life down and just go play golf. And he's going on all these adventures all over the world, and he continues to, to get out there and, you know, scan and go backcountry skiing and all kinds of stuff. And so it was really cool to see him get that accomplishment. This was actually on the Today Show um, last week. And I happen to be just in this clip with him, but that the, the focus was on art. Love it, love it. What are your, what, you know, talking, getting to know art, uh, what you're doing right now, as I just quickly thumb through the Instagram, because I want everyone to connect with you on Instagram. Mm -hmm. What are some of the secrets, Mark, to staying, staying healthy, staying flexible, being able to do this stuff as we get a little bit older? Any tips you can share with the rest of us? Yeah, there's me, by the way, on the, uh, the uh, you know, the seven, um, you can see up there, I've got seven fingers. I actually have a, a photo now of all seven summits with, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, a photo like that. And also, too, if you want to show that center photo, um, not that one, but the one down below with the diagram below that. And yeah. the re yeah, and the reason why I want to show that is you that that's basically the route when you're trying to get up and go into Camp One and Camp Two. Obviously, it's an illustration, and the very top that saddle up there is called the South Coal. That's twenty six thousand five hundred, and the illustration of getting to the top it's actually way steeper than that. But you know that's kind of the the painted. And then if you click out of that really quick, one last. And then the one directly, I think, let me see here, to the left, to the left of that. Um, that's showing the 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 the, the Kumba ice fall. So as it kind of goes from the, the left and streams up, you know, to the right. It's kind of a big jung jungled mess, but it's just, it's almost like if you get a picture um, in completely different apples and oranges, but when the Twin Towers fell and it was just all that twisted steel on top of each other. And that's kind of what that's like. Hey, Mark, to put this in perspective, this was taken, what, from base camp? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How long did it, did it take you to, when you land, to start this journey to hike up to base camp where this picture was taken and then from base camp to the top of Everest? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, you're constantly kind of going up and down, but it's, it's and you, you're never doing all this in just one movement because you're, you're parking at these different camps when you go up the mountain. But just to get to Everest Base Camp from 7,500 to 17,500, um, I think we, it took us to go 40 miles, maybe 10, 12 days, you know, before we actually landed at Base Camp. And then once we got going, then we would just go up, you know, and kind of, get up to camp one at 19,500 and then come down. And the next time we go up to camp two at 21,500 and come back down to, to when I say back down to Everest Base Camp 17.5. And then when go, we went up to camp three, that was 23.5. Then we came back, you know, down. And then when the day that we, we were, or the, the week that we were going up, it took us, I think, six days. And that was, there were some rest days in there at these different camps to get, um, up to camp four before we went forward on the 23rd of May. That's just amazing. Let me bring this back down. Mark, I want to respect your time. And, uh, this was fantastic. I mean, what, what an amazing adventure. We're so glad that you're home safe and sound. And I've got a lot of questions, but let me just kind of wrap this up, you know, in yeah. two minutes or so. But I'm all, I'm all good. All right. All right. So the questions, some of them I'm paraphrasing, What's next on the list for you when it comes to adventures? Is it going to be more climbing or different athletic activities? Somebody asked me, have you ever done a triathlon? Are you a triathlete? Because this looks like it takes a lot of work. You got a lot of physical uh, 
qualities and abilities? Have you ever done that? What, what's in the future? That's a great question. You know, I, I took myself so far to the edge. I mean, to the yeah. edge of like, you know, I can't die today, you know, and, and I have never been to that point before where you're that exhausted, that exposed, that far out there. Um, in terms of probably high altitude mountaineering, you know, I'm probably going to shut that down. And that's really defined like by K2 and some of these other ones that you're out there for months at it. And I just don't want to go suffer that way anymore. You know, I've been doing this now for long. And, you know, you you sort of asked this in the very beginning. And I think, you know, this is a great way to cap things off here. You know, why did I get into the seven summits? Why did I get into climbing? And, you know, at the time I was going through a rough patch in my life. Um, my now ex didn't want to be married anymore. And, and that was hard on me breaking up the family and everything. And, um, and so I had to find a big, a big goal in my life to really help pull me out of it. And so, you know, I, that's where I went back and I did some research. Like if it was any NFL guy climbed the seven summits, yeah, and I said, I'm going to be that guy. And it really helped emerge me out and pull me out. And so where I started, which is kind of in this place where I was trying for healing, the mountains helped with the serenity and the peace and what I needed. And I'm at such a different place in my business. Things are going great. And, you know, I just completed this and that's going great and relationship and that's going great. And, and so, um, you know, where I started, you know, the goal of trying to bring healing all happened. And so now I'm at this point where I'm going, okay, what's next? And so, you know, the thing I kind of have in front of me um, is take it easy this summer. I'll continue to hike and climb. I was out there last two days in a row. So I'll continue to do that, but more like one day hikes and, and outings and things like that, not two months. Um, and then I'm, I'm working with the NFL right now, putting together this film. Um, which I'm excited about doing. And then uh, Higher Ground is having a huge event here in Sun Valley, a uh, big fundraiser for them that myself and Jim Moore are going to host um, and be the MC of. And so I'm, I'm gearing kind of towards these, these things. Um, but there will be another thing. And, you know, I love goals. I love setting them. I love going after them. And so I just have to reset my mind um, and then, you know, go forward. And there's nothing wrong with take, taking a deep bath, taking a few t steps back and just enjoying things for a, a little while, right? Hey, Why man, I, 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 yeah, I'm still trying, you know, I, I lost 25 pounds. So, yeah, if any, nice. and I didn't, you know, I'm a fairly skinny guy. So, I mean, that's another reason why I really struggled on summit day. But, you know, I'm still 15 pounds down. So, I'm, gotcha. I'm slowly kind of like, you know, working Dude, I, my way I, back I, into it. I'm 63. I get it. Like I love running and that's my therapy. Right. And I get it. Yeah. And um, I'll never stop being active, you know, doing the things that I do real quick. Uh, someone asked me about your eye. You had uh, ice, ice blindness in, in one of your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. Is, is yeah I can, I can, I, I can see just fine now, but you know, okay. at the, the time, at the, you know, it, it, it was so I, you know, the, the I was uh, temporarily blind for about, 96 hours. Um, How does that happen? And, because you've got all the equipment. I mean, is that something you can't plan for? Well, I, I you know, it, this was, this was my, you know, I had a couple of my faults and this was another one, okay. but my, okay. our lead guide, you know, started and I've done this before. So it's not like I hadn't done this, but um, or, because it's pitch black, we're wearing headlamps. And now if we go, so you're trying to see, and when you put on goggles, you know, those are dark lenses and, you know, you can't see out of them. So it makes it really hard to see. And I hadn't put on my glasses yet or my goggles. And so I was just going, you know, with nothing, just a mask like that. And, um, you know, that's within 45 minutes, you know, it just ripped right through my retina. And, and so that's how that happened. And then my face, there was a big, it was really odd, but there was a big, huge scab, um, literally looked like a gigantic sunburn. You know, it's gone now, but it was all down the side of that. So I was okay. dealing with, you know, just the pain of all that just hammering against the left side of my face. Okay. So, so Mark, for, for the viewers around the world that want to enjoy your journeys, enjoy listening to some of the stories you you're, you've been sharing and they yeah. want to subscribe to your podcast, finding your summit with over a hundred thousand mm -hmm. downloads, 180 episodes, uh, powerful conversations with celebrities, athletes, sports legends. Uh, can they connect 
to your podcast via the Mark Patterson NFL.com or is there yeah, like yeah, no, we, we host them there too. So you can either go okay. there and you can just, you know, find your way at the very top. If you want to, you know, have the automatic thing, go to iTunes or Spotify or anything, you know, go for it. It's all there. All right. It's all there. Balls in your court, everyone. Stay connected with Mark. Let's support with with, with what he's doing when it comes to taking on epilepsy. And uh, listen, between now and the next time you and I talk, Mark, or for those of you watching, you know, enjoy the journey. It's a, It's been an interesting journey this past year. But if Mark can summit Mount Everest, we certainly should be able to summit our own mountains throughout the course of our days. You guys take care. Thanks for joining us. Mark, sit tight for just a second. And everyone yeah. out there, make it a masterpiece. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.